we review God's blueprint for the local church, the call to equip every believer for ministry, our pursuit of hosting God's presence and manifesting His glory, and our mission to impact our city, nation, and nations for Jesus Christ. Come, be part of this journey. All right, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And we'll read verse 23. And then we will rise up and make our declaration after that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. The writer of Hebrews, in this passage here, starting at verse 19, he's, he's talking about us entering into the very presence of God. He says, you know, we have boldness to enter into God's presence. Jesus has opened up for us this new and living way. Uh, we have a high priest, somebody representing us in the very presence of the Father. Uh, so this is, you know, just so wonderful. We can come boldly uh, to the very presence of God. Uh, have your conscience clear. Come with a clear conscience. But in this approaching, as we are approaching God, he mentions one very important thing that we ought to do, and that's in verse 23. While we are approaching God with this new and living way, there's something we are supposed to be doing. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So while you're drawing near to God, you're coming in the very presence of God. Jesus opened up for us a new and living way. We come boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, we make our petitions and so on. Uh, while we are doing that, there's one thing we also ought to be doing. He says, hold fast to the confession. The word confession simply means to say the same thing. To speak in agreement with. So you hold on to what you're confessing, what you are saying in agreement with what God has said. Hold on to the confession of our hope or of our faith without wavering. You don't have to waver on this. Don't waver on your confession of what you're saying in agreement with God's words. Confession, the, it's, it's the word confess has two parts to it. It comes from the Greek word homologia. Homo means the same thing. Logia is the words we speak. So you're saying the same words that we speak. Same words that God has spoken. We are saying it. We are confessing it. Hold fast to the confession of our faith. The confession of our hope. Without wavering. Because the one who made that promise. He is faithful. So as you approach God. You confess. Father I thank you. You are my healer. Father I thank you. You are my provider. Father, I thank you. You are my protector. Father, I, I declare that you are the one who makes the way for me. You are the one who orders my steps. You are saying in agreement with what he has promised to you. Hold fast to the confession of your faith without wavering. Because he who promised you, he is faithful. So let's rise up to our feet this morning uh, as we make our confession of faith or our declaration of faith. We are saying what God has said. We are holding fast our confession because the one who promised us is faithful. So let's lift our Bibles high up in the air. Say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered. Redeemed, I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Shake hands, please, with people around you. Say hello. Give them your name. Give them a nice smile. And you may be seated. Thank you. All right. 
This morning, it's a simple word of reminder to all of us here at All People Church. I want to just uh, bring a message which is more of a, which serves more of a reminder to us of who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing what we're doing, what are we pursuing, and what is the direction in which we are going as a church community, as a body of believers. Uh, one of the reasons we do that is because we all tend to forget. Now, we may have heard it in the past, maybe six months ago, maybe a year ago, or maybe a little longer than that. And then we tend to forget, you know, why are we here? Why are we coming together? Why are we praying? Why are we doing what we're doing? And, uh, you know, what's the big picture like? And so this morning, it's just a word of reminder for all of us. So we'll begin this morning from Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 18 and 19. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, Jesus speaking to Peter, the apostle Peter, at this time he has just had a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. He said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. This is who you are. Uh, Peter had received that by revelation. And then Jesus responds and he says this in verse 18. I say to you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. Verse 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Jesus says, Peter, on this rock, that means on this truth that you've just uttered, what is it? That Jesus Christ is the, is the Christ, the son of the living God. On this truth, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. So Jesus is building his church. He's still doing it. He's building his church. Now, he didn't say, I'll build many churches. He said, I will build my. So he's building only one church. Just one church. Which, of course, is made up of people like you and me. People around the globe. People who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who have embraced him as the Christ. The son of the living. We are part of that church. All of us who believe in Jesus Christ. So he has one church. It's a spiritual entity. A spiritual uh, or, organism. Or a spiritual being. That's part, that the Bible calls us his body. We're all part of that one church. And he said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So that's the nature of this church that he's building. He's building a church that is powerful. He's building a church that even the gates of hell will not be able to stop it. Now, the gates is a picture that he's drawing from the Old Testament. The Old Testament cities, they had gates that controlled the entry and the exit. The, it controlled Everything that happened in the city. The jurisdiction of that city was administered at the gates of the city. So gates represent control centers, power centers. And Jesus is talking about the gates of hell. Meaning areas of demonic domination. These are power centers of hell. And Jesus is saying the church I will build. The church I am building is a church that is so strong. That is so powerful. The areas of demonic domination will not be able to restrain it or prevail over it. Amen. That means you and I are part of a church that Jesus is building. He's working in us. What he's building us and making us to be are a people who will have authority, dominion over all that the devil is doing. Or all the powers of hell. It may not seem like it at the moment. But he's not done with us yet. 
Amen? He said, this is the kind of church I'm building. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he continued. He said, I will give you the keys. Keys represent authority. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God, the authority of God's kingdom is vested in the church. The church is God's agent here on earth, authorized by heaven. The keys of the kingdom of heaven is given to you, to you and me, the church. For us to permit or to disallow, to bind and to lose. That means you allow or you disallow. You are administering, the, the church is administering God's purposes here on earth. The literal Greek there is we bind on earth what is bound in heaven. And, what, and we allow on earth what is allowed in heaven. That means we release, we permit, we give permission to things on earth as, it, as God permits in heaven. So that's the church's assignment. You can say an amen. That's the kind of church Jesus said he will build. And that's what you and I are part of. And we are called to be that. Administrators of kingdom authority here on earth. Authority that supersedes the gates of hell. Anything that the devil is doing here on earth. He said, I will build my church. Amen. Now there is only one church that Jesus is building. But that one church, which is a spiritual entity, meets physically in many local churches. Do you agree with that? Right? So we all belong to that one church, but we meet physically in many, many different local churches. Now there are possibly thousand or more local churches in our own city. And there are many, many, many around the world. But believers, all of us, we belong to one church. Physically, we meet in different local churches. The local church is important because while we are all members in that spiritual body, we live out our membership in that spiritual body in the context of a local church. So a local church is important. You know, sometimes people don't like it when you say you need to be committed to a local church. As I belong to that spiritual body and I just float around anywhere. So then I usually ask them, you mean, how would, it, how would you feel if your body parts just floated everywhere? You don't know if your arm is going to be attached to your body when you wake up. Because it's just decided to go join some other body. Body parts don't float around. The church, the Spiritual body and so also the physical expression of that, which is the local church, is a body. And so you need a sense of commitment that I am part of this body and we are growing together. And so that commitment to a local church is important. Paul writes about this in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. He's writing to a local church, the church in Ephesus. And he tells Timothy here, he says, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. So he's saying, this local church that I'm talking to you about, that I've been writing to you about and giving you instructions on how to behave, how to conduct yourself in the house of God. This local church is called the house of God or the household of God meaning the family of God. So this household of God, the local church is called that. But he also calls the local church, he goes on saying, which is the church of the living God. Notice he's calling the local church with the same term as the spiritual church. He's calling the local church, church of the living God. So even the local church is called by the same name, Church of the Living God. Because we are the physical expression of that spiritual body. So the local church is to grow up 
and become. It's to develop into everything that Jesus has intended for his spiritual church, the spiritual body. Are you with me? We are the physical expression. Of that spiritual body. And so as the church of the living God. We are to grow up. Every local church has to grow up. Has to develop. Into that fullness. Of what he has intended. For that spiritual body. We are the household of God. The church of the living God. The pillar and ground of truth. So. Why am I emphasizing that? Because. In the Bible. In the New Testament. We find ten aspects we find the blueprint for the local church so before you build a building most often we have a blueprint it's very rare that somebody says okay let's build and there's no blueprint you have a blueprint an architect draws that up for you and says you know this is where the walls will go this is where the windows will be the doors the rooms you have a blueprint and then the building, the construction happens according to that blueprint. So in the New Testament, the Lord has given us a blueprint for His church, the spiritual church. And we take that and we say, you know, if that's the blueprint for the spiritual church, then that's the blueprint for the local church. And so we have to develop the local church according to His blueprint. For his church. Are you with me so far? Now the blueprint will not specify what color the walls have to be painted. Whether you want carpets on the floor or whether you want tiles or granite. That's up to you. So that the denomination decides. But regardless of what denomination you are. Regardless of what color you paint the building, just make sure the construction is according to his blueprints. So, we've, you know, we've put this blueprint that we see in scripture in, 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 a, in a book that's called The Household of God. The House of God, you can find it. But I want to just highlight that blueprint because in everything we are doing here, we are working to develop us as a local church according to God's blueprints. So if we haven't realized it yet, everything we do is to help each of us grow and for us collectively to grow and develop into that blueprint that God has for us in His Word. So there are 10 pictures of this blueprint that we see in Scripture. That means 10 areas, 10 aspects that the Lord wants us to grow up into, develop in. And you'll see that there. Each of these describe what we are supposed to be like as a church, as a body, as, as a community. And each of these areas, you know, you can study this in depth and, and understand, you know, what's involved in growing up in these areas. But I'm just going to make mention of that briefly. This morning. The reason is I want us to understand. You know we are growing up in each of these 10 areas. So first the body of Christ. The body means we are the expression of who Jesus is. He's the head. We are the body. The body cannot be any different than what the head is. The body executes what the head commands. So we are his hands and feet. We go to. We represent Jesus on the earth. The body without the head is dead. So, so important. Stay connected to the head. That's Jesus Christ. Your head is not your pastor. Amen. So we as a body should be focused. Connected to Jesus. He is the head. We are the body. But as the body, it also the Bible also emphasizes this, that each one of us are members in the body, and every member has a place and has a function in the body. Amen? That means each one of us, the Lord Jesus, has a place for you and has a function for you in His body. So one of the things we work on is trying to help each person 
encourage each person, help each person discover your place and start functioning. Because there are no vestigial organs in the body of Christ. No unnecessary parts. Who are you? I'm just hanging in there. No. You are an important part of the body. You have a place and a function that the Lord Jesus has picked out for you. And each one of us should start. Discover your place and start functioning. We are the family of God. As a family, it talks about relationships. Love and care for each other. So you don't just come to church and as soon as the pastor says, Amen, run off. That's okay if you do it for the first three weeks. But hey, beyond that, you're supposed to be family. That means there's got to be some relationships, friendships. You connect. And of course, you can't connect with everyone, but maybe a few people. We are the family of God. We've got to relate to one another as brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, relating to one another. The family talks about people in different stages of growth and maturity. So some of us may be little children. You've got a lot of liberty. You can make noise and you know run around and nobody's going to discipline you much. But then when you grow up a little bit, you become a young, a young person. The expectations are different. The disciplines are different. When you grow up, and, and, and you, you become a young adult. You carry responsibility in the house of God. And eventually, we want everyone to become fathers and mothers in the house of God. Capable of nurturing other people in the house of God. No one has the privilege of remaining a baby forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> that privilege is not extended to anybody. As the family of God. We've got to grow up to become fathers and mothers. Meaning you are now nurturing other people. There will be a season when you are dependent on being nurtured and cared for. But you need to outgrow that and become a young adult and become a father and a mother. Where now you are able to take care of other people. That's the family. Are you with me? That's the family of God. Another picture of the church we see is the pillar of truth. That means we are the upholders of truth in our world and in our society. That means each one of us must uphold truth. There we go. For that we need to be taught. Clear, must clearly understand what is truth. What is the truth we must uphold? What does the Bible say on various issues of life and social issues and other things that the world's facing. What, is, what does the Bible say? We need to know that clearly. So we emphasize speaking the truth and telling it like it is, but do it in love. Don't compromise. Sometimes truth hurts. It depends on which side of the door you're standing. It can knock you in the face. But if you're standing on the right side, it's an open door. Gives you access to a lot. So what we need to Speak the truth, teach the truth, impart the truth. Because you and I are pillars and ground of truth. We are to uphold truth in this world. And the world desperately needs that. People are so confused. They don't know what right from wrong. And God is looking to his church, meaning to you and me. People to uphold truth. Another picture of the church is God's chosen people. We are called Zion, God's chosen people. It means that we are people who belong to Him, His kingdom. And so we live on earth, on foreign territory, but according to His values, cultures, and principles. We live according to kingdom values, kingdom culture, kingdom principles. Because why? We are God's chosen people. So we need to teach, we need to impart. Hey, these, these are the values we live by. This is the culture we embrace. These are kingdom principles. And this is what we live by. We are God's chosen people. We are a peculiar people. We may be living on foreign territory, but we live by those principles. Another picture of the church is that we are an army. Which means we are engaged in conflict. We can't sit down and just relax. Take it easy. No, we are army. We are soldiers. 
And so we need to equip God's people. Say, hey, these are your spiritual weapons. You need to stand up and fight the good fight of faith. Because the devil's not going to leave you alone. It's going to come against you. There's a battle at your hands. And you've got to fight. And this is how you fight. This is how you stand firm in faith. This is how you engage the enemy. You may take a few knocks. But we are there to help you stand back on your feet. And keep fighting. Because we are an army. Amen. Now notice the church is both a family and an army. So you need to know when to behave like family. And when to behave like an army. Sometimes we get the wrong opponent. <laughs> hey, you're not fighting your brothers. <laughs> they, they are family. The enemy is different. So don't mix up. We are family. We are also an army. We are fighting the powers of darkness. We are the lampstand. We are the light in this world. We bring his light in this darkness. We shed light so that people can know and see who our God is. We are the lampstand. Jesus taught us that we are light in this world. We are, he is the wine and we are the branches on the wine. So the life we live, we live based on our intimacy with God. Out of that intimacy with God comes everything. And so we emphasize abiding in Him. Because only out of that comes fruitfulness. And in that whole picture of, of us being the branches on the wine, Jesus said this. He said, if you bear fruit, here's what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to prune you. So that you can bear more fruits. So every time we think we as a church are being fruitful, we should get ready for some pruning. So that we can become more fruitful. Pruning simply is cutting off what is unnecessary. Things that were okay in one level of fruitfulness will no longer be okay in the next level of fruitfulness. So someone will come and say, Pastor, Pastor, two years ago that was okay, but why are you saying now it's not okay? Because two years ago we were at a different level. And now we want to move up to new levels of fruitfulness. Are you understanding? As branches on the wine, he prunes us so that we can become more fruitful. And he works on us collectively as a church. We are also the temple of God. The dwelling place of God. That means we must host His presence. God wants to dwell amongst us. And in His temple, He wants His glory to be manifest. That means who He is. His nature, His attributes, His works. That's His glory on display. So we emphasize presence and glory. Presence and glory. Because we are His temple. The temple of God must be holy. So we talk about holiness. Because God's dwelling amongst us. So we've got to be holy. We're a house of prayer and worship. Prayer and worship. Two important things we need to grow in. And we're not there yet. We are at a certain level of worship. We are at a certain level in our engagement in prayer. But we need to grow. We need to grow desperately, moving up to new levels of worshiping God and praying, engaging in prayer. But we are a house of prayer and worship. And so we want to lift us up, 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 higher and higher to new realms and new levels of prayer and worship. And we are the bride. As the bride, we are engaged to Jesus. We are being prepared for him, the bridegroom God. That means we can't be distracted looking here and there for other proposals. You stay focused. No distractions. You are set apart for Jesus Christ. You are his bride. It means you're lost in love and adoration. And you're listening in to the secrets of his heart that he longs to reveal to you. Because you're his bride. Being prepared. That's who we are. So, as, uh, as pastors, as leaders, and 
and, and, and uh, the various ones of us who are serving, what are we trying to do? We're just trying to facilitate the growth and the development of us as a community in each of these 10 areas. You got it? That's what we're doing. No tricks up our sleeve. This is it. So all the messages we bring, the things that we try to teach, is, is, is focused on one of these 10 areas. Let's take the church up a little bit in this area. Let's take the people up a little bit in this area. Growing up in all of these to the fullness of who Jesus Christ is and what he has designed for the church. So in order to achieve that, what do we have to do? We have to equip every believer in the word and in the spirit. God has given us only two things, his word and the Holy Spirit to work on us, to become what he wants us to become. His word, the Holy Spirit. His word, the working of his word and the working of his Holy Spirit. So that's why we emphasize you've got to get into the word. Let's teach the word because it's his word that is able to build you up. And give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. It's his word. So you've got to get into the word. You've got to teach the word. And the work of the spirit. We need to open up our lives for more and more of the working of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit is going to change us from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ. So our goal is to equip. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 13. It says, he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Question. Who is going to do the work of the ministry? Look at it very carefully. Who is going to do the work of the ministry? The, the saints. Not the apostles and prophets. I mean, their ministry, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists are in the church to equip the believers so that every believer can do the work of the ministry. Now, don't get Confused by that word ministry. Because when you talk about ministry, we think preaching and leading worship. That's not it. Ministry simply means acts of service. Doing, serving the Lord. Doing what God has called you to do. Your assignment. That's ministry. So the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist has been put in the church to equip every believer. So that every believer can fulfill their ministry, their service, what God has called them to do. Amen? So that's what we are after. To equip every person. Hey, you've got a ministry. God's got something for you to do. And so our goal is to equip you. Give you all the word and all the spirit, anointing, everything you need so that you can go out and do a good work for God, for his kingdom, whatever he has in store for you. It may be inside the church. It may be outside. It's okay. Whatever you do that God wants you to do, that's ministry. Amen? So that's what we're working towards. Equipping every person to do the work. Of the ministry. And what will happen? It says for the edifying of the body of Christ. The body of Christ will be built up. And we'll all come to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. We'll come to a mature man. To a full grown man. The church will come up. To a full grown man. And what does that full grown man look like? It's the full standard of Jesus Christ. The church will be like Jesus. But in order to get there. We need to equip every saint for the work of the. So that's what we are after. We're not here to entertain. We are here to equip. Amen? So you say, Pastor, why don't you make a crack some jokes? And I, sometimes jokes come. 
that's okay. Because the focus is not to entertain. The focus is to equip you. It's to give you that word. Give you that spirit. The anointing of the spirit. The realms that we need to move into. Because that is what is going to enable you to fulfill your ministry. So that the church can be edified, built up, and come to that full measure of the stature of Christ. So let me just throw in a little promo here for our weekend schools. You know, every month we run weekend schools. And these weekend schools are two days of intense training on a certain theme. And I encourage each one of you to attend these weekend schools several times. You're not going to get everything if you sit there just one time. Because there's so much that is imparted in, and, and, and you need to be, you know, I, I appreciate some people who've attended it three times, some people attended seven times, uh, the same week in school. Because every time it's different, you keep getting quipped. So I, I want to encourage each one of you. You know, the Sunday mornings are okay, you get 45 minutes of ministry. But those week in schools are important uh, in different topics. And each one of us need to be trained in all of those areas, whether it's the prophetic, the gift of the Spirit, healing and deliverance or uh, prayer and intercession. Get equipped in those areas so that you can use it whichever er whichever field you may be working in or serving God in. You can use all of that. It's transferable across the board into all areas of life and ministry. So please do attend. Take advantage of that. So as we are equipping people, building the church up, what are we pursuing? We have one common pursuit, which is to host the presence of God and to manifest the glory of God. We want to be a body that hosts God's presence. That God is dwelling in this among this people. Host His presence. And display His glory. His glory, who He is, what He does, should be seen through His people. When people look at us as a community, people look at us as believers, they should see who God is. Yes, that's displaying His glory. And God desires that to take place. And there are many scriptures on that. I'll just reference one, Ephesians 5.27. It's talking about how Jesus is working in the church. And He's working on us to do what? That He might present her to Himself a glorious church. So where is He getting us to? To be a glorious church. Meaning a church full of His glory. That's what he's doing. He's working in us to make us a people full of his a glorious church. There's no spot, no wrinkle. And that's what he's working on us to do. Lastly, as we are being equipped, as we are being developed in all those ten areas, as we're being equipped in the word and the spirit so that we can host the presence of God and manifest or display his glory, why are we going after it? Because ultimately, we have one major desire, which is to impact our city, our nation, and the nations for Jesus Christ. Just think about it. The Lord could have taken all of us home the day we got saved. You could receive Christ as your Savior. Okay, come on up. Let's go. I mean, it'd be great. Why go through all the problems and all the hardships that are here on earth? Just, God, I pray the salvation prayer. I'm ready. But he left us here on earth for a purpose. While we, there are many aspects to this. One major reason is, hey, go impact cities, nations for Jesus Christ. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded. That's a reason why he's left us here. So let's get on that assignment. Let's do that. Let's impact our city, our nation, and the nations of this world for Jesus Christ. While God is working on us and developing us and maturing us as individuals and as a church, we have work to do, which is to win souls, make disciples. And you and I are familiar with this verse, you know, the whole earth. God said, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And I pray and I envision often, Lord, let 
Bangalore city be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Now you can envision this with me. Imagine a city where the whole city is excited about one thing. About Jesus. Imagine a city. Imagine Bangalore city. Where everyone. Regardless of what language they speak, English, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Hindi, Nepali, whatever language, or the whole city, there's a buzz in the air, there's an excitement. And everybody is excited about Jesus. He said, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Lord, how about our city, which is a speck on this globe? How about our city being filled with the knowledge of the glory of God? Is it possible? You look at church history and church history says, yes, it's possible. It has happened over and over again. Several parts, several regions of this world. But there was a group of people who prayed in and said, God, we want more of you. In us and in our city. You can use different language. You can call it revival. You can call it outpouring. You can call it a move of the spirit. Whatever you want to call it. But there were people who prayed and said, we want more of God. And God visited them to such an extent that the, the whole region was excited about Jesus Christ. It's happened. And so, you and I pray. Because there's only one way that we can impact the city of Bangalore. It's by a move of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it ourselves. Our best programs will fail. But when the Spirit of God moves powerfully through the church, meaning through people like you and me, the whole city can and will be affected. Amen? Well, since it's raining, we can keep going. <laughs> you can't go anywhere. You have a captive audience now. No, I'm just joking. So we need to pray into that and say, God, there's only one answer. There's only one way in which Bangalore City is going to be affected. And it's going to be by a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the church. A mighty work of the Spirit. Because we can't do it ourselves. But when the Spirit of God moves like He has moved so often in church history, this city will be affected. But God is looking for people who will pray for that. Ask Him for that. God, we want that. We want a mighty outpouring of your Spirit. We want revival. Or you can use whatever language you want. But we want more of the Spirit of God flowing through the church. So in conclusion, I want to invite each of us to be a part of this journey. Our goal here this morning is to give us an understanding of what we are up to. What are we doing? Jesus is building His church. We are a physical expression of that. One of the many. But he's raising up a church that is strong. It's powerful. That will dominate the works of darkness. And as we co-labor with Jesus. We are working on developing us in all of these 10 areas. Helping us grow in these 10 areas. The, uh, by equipping us with the word and the spirit. Activating every person in their ministry. Whatever God's called them to do. Some of you are already doing what God's called you to do. And some of you are are in the process of getting ready, being prepared, trying to understand um, what God wants you to do. And all of us are in different stages in our journey. That's okay. Our goal is to equip, get you ready, keep you going, so that you can fulfill the ministry God has for you. And as we equip you, we are together in one pursuit. God, we want your presence and we want to manifest your glory. We want to display your glory so that our city and our nation and nations can be reached. Amen? Let's rise up to our feet, please. We'll call our worship team up. I want to invite you. Be a part of this journey and say, God, I understand what you're doing. And I open up my heart to receive. Work in me. Equip me. 
so that I can do the ministry you've called me to do. You don't have to copy your neighbor. God has something very specific for each one of us. There's a ministry for each one of us. But you need to be equipped for that. So you take in as much as you can the word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. Because without his word, without his spirit, none of us can do what he's called us to do. And we want to serve you faithfully. Bringing his word, bringing his spirit into your, more of his, working of his spirit into your life. So that you can do what God's called you to do. As you stand here this morning, would you just pray and say, God, equip me, get me ready, prepare me. For the ministry, the work of service you have for my life. And I'm willing to be equipped. None of us know it all. None of us have it all. But if we open up ourselves and are teachable. And are eager to learn and willing to learn. God will equip us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to move through and in each of us powerfully, God. Because we know the church is not the work of a man. The church is not the work of an organization or a denomination. The church is the Lord's work by His Spirit. I pray that right now you will touch every person standing here, Holy Spirit. Let your presence be felt. Birth in each of us a sense of divine purpose. We know there is a ministry for each of us. Give us the grace to be willing to be equipped, willing to receive training, equipping, to keep growing in the Word, to keep growing in the Spirit. welcome you God we welcome you God Thank you. I want us to understand that the ministry God has for us doesn't necessarily have to be something you do in church. But it could be things outside. Some of you may want to do something in the area of education. Some of you may want to do something to take care of little children. God births various kinds of ministry. So pursue what God's put in your heart. Pursue what God's calling you to. But do it with the help of His Holy Spirit. Because when the anointing is on you, when you do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be successful. Nothing can stop you. No mountain can successfully obstruct you. No valley that you might have to go through can cloud out or darken your vision. You'll be able to come through. So 
do it by the help of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Fill us with your power. Come live inside me. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with.
Father, we just present ourselves to you and ask that you will help us as a people, God, to grow up, to develop, to mature, to move to new levels and all that you've called us to be, God. In each of these areas that we've talked about, that we've seen your word, Help us to grow as a people, as a community. Help us to do that. We invite, Lord, the work of your Holy Spirit. We receive and embrace your Holy Word. Help us grow. I, uh, I just want to say this, and I don't want to say it in any sense of condemnation or anything, but I just feel that as homes, as families, we need to come together in our homes to pray together every day. Or at least as many days of the week as we possibly can. So those of us who have families, I realize some of us are single and you take your personal time with God. But those of us who have families, I want to encourage us. Fathers, mothers, get your family together. If possible, every evening. Spend a little time. Evening or morning, that's your choice. But spend a little time. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever time you can. To just pray together. Can we do that, please? Some of you are already doing it. And just keep doing it. It's very good. But some of us need to do it. Maybe you've just, you've just fallen off the way. I feel very strongly that's something God wants us to bring back in our homes. So could you please do that? Just get your family together. Ten minutes, whatever. Just pray. Read something from the Word of God or listen to our living supernaturally. <laughs> Five, ten minutes. Just do that. Pray. Amen. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.